We got time. Um, yes, a brief look. How would you use my eyes? Okay. <clears throat> so, yes, um, as they were saying, uh, I studied who should see. Um, so, hi, I'm Evelyn Hobbs. That's my name. Uh, I'm a Fair Haven student, actually, with a concentration in applied linguistics, language revitalization, and social justice. Uh, and I wanted to start this presentation before I get into anything um, by acknowledging that Lushitsit is a language of the Coast Salish people, of uh, uh, the occupied, occupied territory, otherwise known as Washington State, and it is not in any way my language. Um, I'm just somebody who's the only connection I have to it is that it's where the name of the town I grew up in is from, and I want to share my knowledge if it is useful. Um, I want to say also that Salish languages are criminally undervalued and understudied, within linguistics, but given the history of colonialism that the Western Scientific Institution is predicated on, the question of whether I, Western Washington University, or non-negative academics in general have a right to study the language in the first place is a really important one that deserves discussion. It's also not the purpose of this presentation. Um, so instead I would like to present my attempts uh, at understanding the complexity of this of the should see syntax. As I developed them in Linguistics 321, um, especially in regards to its ability to change word form. Um, so, to begin, I actually want to talk about Polish. Uh, so, Polish, among other languages, can change the order of its words uh, in a sentence and still be grammatically correct to the speakers of the language. Uh, they managed to do so without modifying the morphological structure of any of the words in the sentence or adding anything to it, um, unlike English, which has to do with a lot of that in order to change the word. Um, so in Polish, uh, a, a sort of basic sentence uh, about which is meaning uh, Kazia has a home, can be rearranged <laughs> into any, pretty much any form. Um, and so it can be um, and each of them is valid, although the last three, Korpak six, are decidedly less natural sounding to speakers of Polish. Um, the Schutzit is similar in this respect. It's able to rework its sentences into multiple orders without modifying the structure of any individual word or adding anything to the sentence. Uh, it can do so to become um, verb subject objects verb, object, subject, and object, verb, subject, in the things that I've been able to find, anyway, uh, according to the data that's available. And there's no syntactic reason that I can find that it couldn't become the other three as well. Um, object, subject, verb, subject, object, verb, and subject, verb, object. Ugh. However, as was sort of mentioned um, by Emily, the a completely free word order is not really something that um, it would, be, it would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for someone to learn. Uh, just that switch of them being able to go back and forth constantly doesn't really make a lot of sense um, in terms of you know, childhood acquisition of language. Um, then the binary nature X part theory, so uh, it is assumed in, in the restraints of language acquisition, these forms can't like stack on top of each other. So you can separately, if you're talking about two languages, learn English um, verb objects to sort of sit up and Japanese object for sort of set. If you were learning both simultaneously, you could learn both of those things, but they apply to each language individually, and they can't just like smash together at any time, because um, that's not really how the binary nature works. You can't. It's, it, it's, yeah. Um, so the underlying order does not, of course, mean that the sentence cannot be different. You can reorganize um, the sentence into new forms, which is kind of, I mean, we do it all the time. In English, uh, considering for example, if you didn't know, um, sentence, uh, Mulder chased aliens across the world um, is a sentence in English that can, if you so choose, be rewired, removed around uh, to be the aliens were chased by Mulder across the world. It's generally considered passive voice. But um, basic principle is that you're moving the object to the beginning of the sentence instead of the subject. Um, you can also move the prepositional phrase at the end. You can do a lot of fun stuff. Sorry. Um, right, but even if you are moving those things around within the sentence, you're not actually modifying the overall base structure. The underlying structure of the sentence, of the, of the word of the language, is going to stay the same, regardless of how you move the things around. 
Um, so returning to Polish real quick, uh, I'm not a scholar of the language, mind you, but it would seem that the overall meaning of the sentence, if we go back here, does change depending on the, the way in which it is ordered. So the underlying, there is some sort of underlying order to all these things, and then the more you change it, it changes the meaning of the sentence. Um, so there's, there's a reason, there's rhyme and reason to it, it's not just you're doing it right. Changing it to um, put the object in front of the verb means that you are specifying that it is like something that is owned and not being borrowed, it's had kind of thing. So, so there, this sort of idea gives credence to the idea that, that um, there is an underlying form in all languages, including the should see, despite the fact that it moves all over the place pretty freely. Um, so, yeah. So, hang on. Um, with all those concepts out of the way, uh, we can finally actually look at what we should see uses and how it uses movement to modify its um, underlying word order to like get new sentences. Uh, so the sort of primary researchers on we should see are Tom Hanks, Don Bates, and Bob Hilbert, um, and they have put forth in a number of papers, uh, including the sort of we should see dictionary that we should see is um, subject verb object and verb raises to make the surface level appear like the basic word order to appear to be verb subject object. Um, based on the research that I have done, I would argue that there is another position sort of above that things move into um, that it, I'm sort of considering the focus position. Uh, and it, it allows senses to sort of be reworked. So here's some truth. Um, <laughs> So the sentences, both of these sentences mean the same thing. Um, and actually this is slightly confusing because these mean the same thing and there is no written definition for why they're different, even though they are. <laughs> so that would require an actual like, speaker to come and explain. Um, but basically what my, my argument would be is that uh, in the initial sentence, um, you are starting with, with uh, the verb, the subject, the verb, and the object and the verb raising up to fill in this aspect position. Aspect is basically the same as tense. Well, no, not really. But <laughs> it fulfills a similar role as tense. Um, so it moves into the aspect position, and you would have uh, V, S, O. But um, in order to, to have the, oh God. In order to have that construction stay the same, while still allowing um, the object and the subject to switch places, you have to have the verb be able to move to a place higher than the two that are switching places. So the verb can move up into the focus position so that it can be verb, subject, object, or verb, object, subject, just as easily as one or the other. Um, but what's interesting about should see is that then you can also put something besides the verb into that slot. So instead of doing the verb, uh, it is not impossible, it is in fact fairly easy to do. You can use the same exact sentence like, without modifying anything, without adding anything to it, just moving things around, um, to make the object um, the focus of the sentence, the beginning of the sentence. You know, object, verb, subject. Um, and the way to do that is really interesting because what it actually ends up doing is moving the object to um, the aspect positions uh, the thing, the spot, specifier. Um, and then from there, it only takes the noun itself and not the determiner and moves it into the focus position. Um, and that's a basic principle. Okay. And that's the basic principle of that. Um, so we should think it's a little bit more complicated in that it can also have sentences that are just verbs on their own. Uh, this is not true of only we should see, plenty of other places can do this. Um, but it does actually somewhat support this concept uh, in the idea that a little should see sentence can exist on its own as a verb. It is, in, it is giving you all the information you need to create a sentence and all you're doing with the subject and object. And the further sentence is adding on to that information. So you're focusing then if you wanted to have the verb be First position becomes the focus of the sentence, and then the other information is added after. Um, I don't have any more slides. I thought I did. Um, 
So as wonderful as it would have been uh, for this to be like totally accurate and I would be like dancing, it would be great. Um, I don't know if any of this is really all that correct. Uh, because things get really a lot more complicated the more I dig into Lichitsky. Um, part of that complexity complexity is the fact that Lichitsky has like weird distinctions between noun and verbs. Uh, in 1983, Dale Kincaid published a paper, you might have heard of this one, um, titled Salish Evidence Against the Universality of Noun and Verb, in which he posited that nouns and verbs have no definable place in Salish languages, um, which is wild, because that idea would challenge the entire concept of linguistic universals in terms of noun and verb, uh, and it would suggest that a single language family is just not following the same rules that everybody else is following, which is really would be amazing. Um, However, three years later, uh, in 1986, Tom Hess and P. Van Hyde um, published another piece in direct response to this, titled Noun and Verb in Salish, uh, in which they refute Kincaid's assertion and make their own claim that while nouns and verbs cannot be distinguished on like a syntactic level, they can be distinguished on a morphological and morphosyntactic level. Um, but that makes my job as a syntactician really hard. So <laughs> uh, even with the ability to work past that complication, it was also complicated by um, negation, which is like it shouldn't be that difficult, um, as it is the first thing that comes into the sentence, but it also has a proclet that attaches to the next adverb in the sentence or the predicate, depending on the situation. Um, there's also subject pronouns always come in the second position in the sentence, no matter what, uh, and that's sort of something that needs to be figured out. And also, why why would the why would it drop its determiner halfway up? I don't mm -hmm. quite understand why it does that. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I don't have a lot of answers to any of these <laughs> uh, And as far as I know, not really anyone else does either. Um, we could, but before we go about sort of digging into a language that, again, doesn't belong to me or the school as an institution, I think it's um, more important that we work alongside people who the language does belong to, to help them sort of Build it back up, and then once that is, is sort of taken care of, we can, we can work together in unison. Then we can start figuring out sort of this. That's all I had. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah. I was just going to respond that uh, I believe it's the, the Van Eyck and Hess paper that you you mentioned that calls the uh, uh, it marks an oblique argument to the verb, meaning, yeah. However you want to interpret that. <laughs> we'll leave that to the more recent technicians. It's an oblique argument. And so it is it kind of a case marker, preposition, something or other. It's certainly there. <laughs> and then I wanted to add, um, um, Evelyn, if you, if, if you had looked at or thought about uh, how to, you mentioned negation. And so some of the negation that we've seen has the negative at the beginning of the sentence, and then what the would-be predicate is potentially nominalized mm -hmm. with an S prefix. And so you kind of say, it, and it also takes, a instead of a subject, uh, clitic or suffix, it takes a possessive, what's been described as the possessive. So in effect, you say, not my eating, yeah. to say, I'm not eating. You say, not not the my. In, in fact, sometimes with the mm -hmm. determiner, the yeah. T determiner mm -hmm. is So, did you consider that, or had your brain already exploded at that point? Um, <laughs> my brain mostly exploded. It was like, I got a little bit left. And I thought about it some, but, but yeah, that was, that was not, I didn't want to take it to it while I was still trying to figure this out, yeah. necessarily. But, yeah, I could yeah. talk about it. Thank you all the time. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks a lot.